Okay. This hearing will come to order. Uh, good morning. I want to uh, thank our witnesses uh, for being here on this very busy morning. Uh, Ralph Hall looked over at me when he looked at you and said, we've got a good group of folks here today, and I agree with them. Uh, this is a very important hearing on securing the competitiveness of our economic future here in the United States. Just to remind everyone, in 2005, I joined then uh, Chairman Sherry Bowler, uh, Senators Lamar Alexander and Jeff Bingham, uh, in requesting the National Academies to conduct a study assessing the state of our nation's competitiveness. The resulting report was entitled, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, and foreshadowed a troubling future for our nation, one in which our scientific leadership, technolo technological <coughs> edge, and ability to compete effectively in the global economy uh, is uncertain. The report maintained that without decisive action, our children and grandchildren may very well be the first generation of Americans to inherit a standard of living lower than their parents. The report outlined specific actions to be taken to ensure the future competitiveness and prosperity of the U.S., including increasing the federal investment in long-term basic research and improving K-12 science and mathematics education. Congress responded. In 2007, this committee took the lead in drafting legislation to implement the recommendations including in rising above the gathering storm report. This landmark legislation, which became known as the American Competes Act, received overwhelming bipartisan support in both chambers of Congress. It passed by a vote of 367 to 57 in the House, and it passed by, by unanimous consent in the Senate. Norm was at a, an event the other day where I told Senator Alexander and Senator Bingham if they can get unanimous consent in the Senate again, then we're going to recommend them to be special envoys to the Mideast. Um, that should be a piece of cake uh, after working with the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, despite our best laid plans, the America Competes Act is set to expire tomorrow. A little more than nine months ago, in this very room, we held a hearing with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Business Roundtable, and the Council of Competitiveness uh, and on the reauthorization of the America Competes Act. That hearing was one of more than 30 hearings that we've held to inform our reauthorization process, all of which have been very supportive of reauthorization. This competes report, uh, out, uh, the, the committee reported out the American Competes Reauthorization Act of 2010 in April. The bill, which continued uh, critical investments in our science technology and renewed our commitment to future competitiveness and economic security of the United States, passed the House on a bipartisan basis at the end of May. The Senate version of the bill was reported out of, out of the Senate uh, Commerce Committee in July and is currently awaiting floor action. Last week, we received a stark reminder about why the reauthorization and full funding of American Competes is so critical. The original Rising Above the Gathering Storm Report Committee released an update in its, uh, of its 2005 report entitled Rising Above the Gathering Storm Revisited, Rapidly Approaching Category 5. According to the update, the nation's outlook has worsened substantially over the last five years. We now face even greater challenges in sustaining our competitive position in the world. Our marching orders are clear. We must continue what we started, recommit ourselves to the ideas we laid out in the original Competes Act. In this if this report tells us nothing else, it tells us that the worst things that, that, that it tells us that the worst thing we can do is to let our efforts of reauthorization languish. So with that, I recognize uh, the distinguished chairman or ranking member from Texas, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I do. I really do thank you. Uh, and I'm beginning to feel like these hearings with you and, and my friend and all of our friends, Mr. Augustine, are just episodes of deja vu. By golly, uh, we all agree that a strong, skilled, and STEM-educated workforce is critical to our nation's ability to compete, and our ability to remain the leader in innovation is our key to economic success. And you almost described the Senate properly, but my predecessor, Mr. Rayburn, had a new young rep Democrat come in and went to see the speaker. He said, show me which Republican you want me to take care of, and I'll just leave the chimney burning. 
He said, no, no, son, the Republican in the House is not the enemy of the Democrat. The Democrat in the House is not the enemy to the Republican. The enemy is the Senate. <laughs> I think he had it figured out. Almost four years ago, we sat in this room uh, with almost the same panel and officially kicked off what was to become the America Competes Act, as the chairman has set out. As everyone here is aware, America Competes was a culmination of recommendations from the off quoted rising above the gathering storm report, former President Bush's American Competitiveness Initiative and efforts begun by this committee under Republican leadership and continued by you, Mr. Chairman. We all worked in a bipartisan fashion on this endeavor and I'm proud of our accomplishments. My message is exactly the same today as it was then and has been throughout our current reauthorization of competes. If America is going to remain on top in the evolving world economy, we must be dedicated to encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship while simultaneously cultivating a scientifically and technologically astute future workforce. Now, I need to get a speech right. It don't have so many damn big words in it. <laughs> while my message hadn't changed, and, and seemingly neither has the message of Gathering Storm Committee members before us today, unfortunately, our economy has changed. And I'm pleased to see that the Gathering Storm revisited the report acknowledges, quote, the great difficulty of carrying out the Gathering Storm recommendations such as doubling the research budget in today's fiscal environment with worthy demand after worthy demand confronting budgetary realities. However, I take some issue with not doubling the budget being analogous to making an overweight aircraft flight, flight worthy by removing an engine. And that's, that's a pretty good line. Uh, <laughs> <It's just enormous. laughs> that's norm. Uh, rather, I would uh, suggest that the prudent approach would be to ensure that our current investments are creating a successful return on investment and are being more efficiently utilized. Perhaps a better analogy would be that in order to make an overweight aircraft flight worthy, one needs to offload excess baggage, particularly in today's economic uncertainties. We need to make sure that we're reaping the benefits of the numerous initiatives called for in the initial gathering storm report and set forth in America Competes before creating others. I'm sure it troubles all of us on this committee to hear that we continue to be on a decline in a variety of science and technology areas, uh, particularly when we have already legislated numerous recommendations set forth in the 2005 report. This reinforces my belief, however, that other issues beyond funding levels are holding us back. I believe much more needs to be done by all of us, not just the federal government, to keep and in some cases restore the United States to science and technology innovation prominence across the board. Everyone has a role. The private sector needs to step up, our schools and teachers need to step up, parents need to step up, and our children need to step up. I look forward to the testimony of our distinguished panel today because there's no doubt that we still have much to accomplish. Everyone here knows of my deep admiration and respect for Mr. Augustine and the other four here. Some six years ago, I suggested that he might make a good candidate for president, and he hasn't spoken to me since, but uh, uh, I'm serious about that, and I see four there that would make good candidates. I sincerely expect we'll hear that it takes a lot more than just throwing money at R&D to help us achieve our goals, and that America competes is just one aspect of improving America's competitiveness. I hope to hear them speak at length on the other areas raised in their revised report, a majority of which are not within this committee's jurisdiction that are major contributing factors to our competitiveness, encouraging private sector innovation through tax credits, a positive regulatory environment, tort reform, protection of intellectual capital, and other such programs will catapult the American economy, make us more competitive globally, and bring new products and jobs to the American people. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I yield back my time if I have any left. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. I Chairman. Wish that we, um, I just one yeah, the gentlelady from uh, Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I know it's not our custom, but I wanted to take this moment, and I know that um, the ranking member would do it as well, to acknowledge that this would, is probably your last um, uh, sitting in, this, in the chair uh, in this committee, and I just want you to know how much I really appreciate, I know that we all do, your leadership and your guidance of our committee. It is one of the committees in the Congress that operates in the most um, uh, unified way on so many issues, this one included. And so I just want to thank you for your leadership and your guidance and your service in the United States Congress. Well, thank you. We, l let's don't bury the corpse quite yet. Let's let it get cold. We're, we've got a lame duck session. We've got more work to do. We've got to get this competes um, 
passed, uh, but thank you for your, 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 your very nice words. I thought she was talking about me there for a while. <laughs> uh, uh. Well, Mr. Hall, I wish that we had an expanded jurisdiction, because if we did, we would take care of those other issues that, that you mentioned. It's a shame that the United States has the second highest uh, <coughs> uh, corporate tax rate in the world, uh, and we certainly have to have other uh, changes. But all what we have is what's on our plate. So we want to deal with that and, and deal with it well. And we, um, if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the report at this point. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. First, Dr. Norm Augustine is the retired chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin Corporation and former Undersecretary of Army. I think retired is an odd term to be using for him and for Dr. Craig Barrett. The, they also so-called retired chairman and CEO of Intel. I think that um, they probably would like to go back and get a rest uh, running companies rather than all of the, uh, uh, the volunteer efforts they're doing. And, and uh, Dr. Barrett, we know that when you leave your beloved Montana to come here, it's on a mission that, that, that you feel strongly about. And uh, we also thank you for taking uh, the chairmanship of the Change the Equation, uh, rounding up uh, 100 major CEOs that are recognizing the importance of our STEM education and trying to move that ball forward. And Mr. Charles Holliday is the chairman of the board of the Bank of America and the retired chairman of the board and CEO of DuPont. And once again, uh, we know there are other demands, but you have made really service, your patriotic service to the country uh, important. Thank you for that. Dr. Dan Moak is the president emeritus of the University of Maryland, as well as the Glenn L. Martin Institute Professor of Engineering, and I'm sure they would like to see you more at the University of Maryland, but you too have been giving of your time. So Mr. Augustine, uh, please begin your testimony. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Hall, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to appear on behalf of my colleagues on the Gathering Storm Committee, including my three colleagues uh, here at this table. I, I would like to submit a formal statement for the record with the committee's permission. That without exception. Thank you. I, five years ago, as uh, you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, this committee, together with its counterpart in the Senate, uh, asked the National Academies to uh, examine America's future competitiveness outlook. And the members of the Academy Committee uh, quickly interpreted that to mean the ability of all Americans to have the opportunity to compete for quality jobs in the new global economy. I, our conclusion, uh, I'm sorry to say at the time, was that we were on a path uh, at the time uh, whereby we were likely to suffer sustained unemployment at very high levels because Americans simply won't be able to commit, compete successfully for jobs. Uh, the only solution we could see to that was to be among the world's leaders at innovation. Uh, to do that, we pointed to 20 actions that would be required, at least as a starting point. The two highest priorities of those uh, were to improve vastly the nation's K through 12 education system and to uh, double the funding for basic research primarily at our nation's research universities. We emphasize the importance of science and engineering because uh, numerous studies have shown that over half of the growth in GDP for many years has been attributable directly to advancements in science and in engineering. We've made progress uh, thanks to uh, the work of this committee to a very large degree. Uh, the American Com America Competes Act made possible a number of important actions have taken place. Uh, the research budget at least has begun on the new trajectory we proposed. Uh, ARPA-E is, uh, I think, successfully launched and underway. Uh, the R&D tax credit uh, was continued. The uh, State Department uh, reassessed the uh, requirements that were being imposed for uh, visa uh, applicants uh, who wanted to be students in this country. But there's a problem, and the problem is that almost uh, all the good things that have been done have been dependent uh, uh, upon uh, funding from the, America, uh, from the uh, stimulus package and from authorization from the America Competes Act. And as you know, both of those are uh, due to expire momentarily. So we stand on a precipice in terms of the accomplishments that have been made. Uh, there are 
a number of overarching things that have gone against us during the past five years since the study was first done. Uh, others are getting better quickly. They're building new universities. Uh, this year there will be uh, 98,000 Chinese students go to school in America, 103,000 Indian students go to school in America, many of them studying engineering and science. Secondly, the stress on the federal budget, as people in this room would know so well, is making it even more difficult to implement many of the things we need to do to be more competitive as a nation. Thirdly, our universities, uh, something that was unthought of five years ago, today are uh, being very much stressed uh, in the sense of uh, uh, reduced financial support from states, uh, reduced endowments, and uh, th this is resulting in other countries, universities, targeting and picking off some of the finest researchers and professors at our universities. And finally, at the time we met five years ago, the biosciences had been well-funded, uh, more accurately, the health, uh, health sciences, uh, whereas uh, since that time, uh, they too have suffered the uh, impact of inflation and some reductions. I would share just a few statistics with you. Uh, uh, we're used to thinking of America as being number one. Uh, today, uh, some facts uh, based uh, from data from respected sources, uh, in terms of innovation-based competitiveness, uh, we've now been ranked number six. Our fraction of the young workforce with a higher high school diploma, we rank 11th in the world. Our college completion rate, we're 16th. Our high school completion rate, 20th. The achievement among 17-year-olds in science, we rank 21st. Broadband internet access, we rank 22nd. Life expectancy at birth, 24th. Uh, uh, achievement of 17-year-olds uh, in mathematics, 25th. Uh, the fraction of college graduates who study science and engineering, 27th. Uh, the rate of improvement in competitiveness, 40th. The quality of math and science K through 12 education, 48th. And the density of mobile telephony subscribers, 72nd. Uh, that's not the America that uh, I like to think of us as being. And can you imagine if our, when our Olympic team uh, finished fourth in basketball, uh, you recall the impact it had and what we did about it. Uh, my hope is that uh, we can have uh, even more energetic impact to these, uh, these circumstances. Uh, this isn't the America that I, I would want to see for my grandchildren, and I suspect many in this room would share that view for their children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Augustine. Dr. Barrett is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be invited here to testify today. I've also submitted a written testimony, uh, and I'd like to supplement that kind of freelance, if you will. Uh, I do uh, not represent Intel, although I worked there for 35 years, and I'm still very proud of that company. It employs nearly 50,000 U.S. Uh, citizens, does 75 percent of its manufacturing still here in the United States, and 85 to 90 percent of its R&D budget is spent here in the United States. And the R&D budget is substantially greater than that of the National Science Foundation, so it's an appreciable investor in R&D here in the U.S. Uh, while CEO and then chairman of Intel, I had the privilege uh, to travel quite a bit. I probably visited over 100 countries uh, for Intel, had the opportunity to speak to business leaders, academic leaders uh, uh, in those countries and government leaders. And during those conversations, I always heard exactly the same thing, and I think it's very true here in the United States. Every one of those countries was interested in increasing its competitiveness the competitiveness quotient, so to speak, was derived by three factors. One was the education level of the workforce. You can't be number one unless you have the number one education system. The investment in new ideas, read the investment in research and development. It's new ideas that create the next generation of products, services, and create wealth. And the third feature they were interested in was the environment environment simply to let smart people get together with smart ideas and do something wonderful. And the environment is uh, partially set by society, partially set by government rules and regulations, tax rates, intellectual property protection, ability to start a company, bankruptcy laws, a whole series of issues. Uh, 
Rising above the gathering storm, the American Competes Act focused on those three issues, smart people, smart ideas, and the right environment. And five years after the fact, uh, the re initial report was introduced, the follow-up report that uh, Norm Augustine mentioned, I, I think we're not batting particularly well on either of those or any of those three topics. Uh, I would fully support the reauthorization of the American Competes Act. Uh, I do not think it is solely an issue of government, though, as uh, the chairman mentioned. It is an issue for society and the private sector to become involved. And uh, you mentioned uh, the private sector in the Change the Equation group, which was just announced a week or so ago here in Washington, D.C., about 110 CEOs of uh, major U.S. corporations involved in uh, science and technology, but also involved in consumer goods and many other industries, have banded together to do their part to promote science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, education and interest in the youth of America. I think one of our biggest challenges is getting the younger generation interested in what's going forward. Change the Equation Group uh, is committed to really three major efforts. One is improve the teaching of science and math in K through 12, better science and math teachers. Uh, secondly, it's involved in getting kids interested in science and math out of school. So that's such things as robotics competitions, science fairs, a number of activities that the private sector is already involved with. We want to amplify those and spread them geographically across the United States. In fact, uh, the first year goal is to have uh, programs of that type in a hundred new geographic areas where programs do not exist today over the next year. Uh, the third thing we're interested in doing is in fact using the CEOs in the private sector as a voice of advocacy for the basic tenets of the American Competes Act and the rising above the gathering storm recommendations. Dealing with state and local legislators to in fact mobilize them to focus on STEM issues, on K through 12 issues, on research university issues, and on job creation in their local areas. I think we're off to a good start in that respect, but by golly, if I look at what is going on around the world, we have a heck of a lot of work in front of us, and unless the American Competes Act is reauthorized going forward and coupling that public sector set of programs with the private sector, uh, I think we're going to continue to struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we appreciate your strong leadership in this regard. Uh, I have a very specific idea to leave with you today that takes our work of this committee to the next step, an idea around low-cost, clean energy. We believe if we could create that in this country, we could do a lot to move those statistics that Norm described in a very different way. And uh, Norm Augustine and myself uh, gathered with us people from companies that have a track record of making a step change in technology. Uh, Ursula Burns from Xerox. We don't call it the Xerox machine for nothing. Uh, John Doerr, who is critical in funding so many of the icon companies now on the West Coast. A guy named Gates, who's done some things around software. Jeff Emelt from General Electric and, and Tim Salsa from Cummings. And they've done amazing things to take the diesel engine to a different area. We said if we were in charge of creating that low-cost clean energy, how would we do it? And we wrote a business plan, which we'd be glad to give you a copy of. And I will just share with you the five very simple recommendations. We said, we think this is possible, but it's going to take some time. It may take a decade. It may take more, and we need continuity over that period of time, and we need a board, a strategy board responsible to you, but it's consistent over a period of time and doesn't change every two to four years. And we believe that's possible. That's how we would do it inside our company. Second, we must fund it to win. You know, the amount of money being spent today is important. It's not enough in our estimation to get there. We think we need $11 billion more dollars. We think it's one of the best investments our country could ever make to create the kind of jobs we need over time. Then we looked at what we've been very successful at in this country, and that's creating clusters of technology and business together. And that's where our big breakthroughs have come. We recommended doing that again. 
We did not say which technologies. We want the market to pick those. We did not say in which cities or what universities they should be tied with, but we think that's a model that's uniquely American that should be taken forward. Something in the America's c Competes that has worked very, very well is ARPA-E. It's this concept of funding entrepreneurs early on with big step change projects. I was out meeting with the Department of Energy people on this very subject just three weeks ago. It said, went project by project, and you would be very proud of what they're doing. The quality of people that Steve Chu and his team have attracted, but also the projects, they meet that requirement. When they're successful, they will be really low cost and really clean energy. They have 37 of them. They all won't be a success. If we could just get three or four of them to be a success, that would be a breakthrough. Our last recommendation is absolutely critical, and we, we found that in all of our work with the National Academies, is you can't have a great technology, but l let it sit in the shelf, let it stay on the lab bench. And from all of our experience in the seven companies that were involved, we all have prototype facilities. We knew we could not go from the lab to scale suddenly. So we had to have a prototype facility necessary. Because of the very high cost of this kind of investment, individual companies will not make that. So we think assistance from the federal government in those prototype facilities is critical. And this strategy board I described in my recommendation number one is the mechanism for handling that. So we, we left this work extremely encouraged. We, we think we, we, we can put a, 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 a significant amount of money. We're not minimizing what $11 billion is but we believe $11 billion per year over a decade can step change our position, and we hope you'll consider it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. I will point out in the American Competes, we do have a cluster program where we can bring those folks together. Um, I, I think it's understood now that there's not that single, uh, or rarely is it that single inventor eureka moment, but rather it's the collaboration of those folks working together on, on, on a topic. Uh, and Dr. Dan Motes is now recognized. Dr. Moch, you need to hit your mic there, please. Talk. I'll stop. Thank you very much. Apologize. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to make a few remarks. Well, first, I, I, would, I would just uh, comment. There's no question that uh, the country has made progress on its support for science and technology since 2005 through the American Competes Act uh, and uh, other uh, initiatives, our um, funds and STEM education initiatives and the like. And national awareness. Uh, is higher now than it was then, and uh, rising above the gathering storm has become a household phrase in many places, and remarkably it has legs five years later, which is in and of itself critical. But as the uh, revisited report, the Category 5 report has come out, um, the United States is relatively less competitive globally today than it was in 2005, probably for three reasons. One is the, the report was not fully implemented in an ongoing manner when it started. A second is uh, other countries have engaged rather aggressively, both those that weren't engaged then and those that were then, uh, in a very determined and purposeful manner. And thirdly, and possibly most importantly, uh, our country has many national priorities today. Wars, national debt, sluggish economy, unemployment, housing, health care, terrorism, and so on. And global competitiveness in s and and innovation is really not near the top in priorities among them. <clears throat> that is a very... Uh, uh, principal problem for us. If we believe delivering a high quality, high paying jobs for Americans depends on competitiveness and innovation in science and technology, then it should be a high priority today. Uh, I recently chaired a National Research Council committee that studied the science and technology strategies of six countries and their implications for the United States. Those, uh, and that's uh, now been printed, as a matter of fact. The six countries are Japan, Brazil, India, China, and Singapore. Now, the countries individually were studied in great detail in terms of why they're succeeding and what their priorities are and how they're progressing, and there are, but there are a couple of findings on the countries themselves and then overall findings as a group. Um, the study concluded, uh, I think surprisingly for the members of the committee, but very importantly, that the best predictor of future science and technology competitiveness was the national culture. While we commonly use economic and uh, capacity measures to rate S&T innovation capabilities, things like percent of GDP going for research or number of engineering graduates, it turns out that the countries that shape their cultures to facilitate their goals 
receive, uh, achieve them predictably and will likely do so in the future. Of the six countries studied, Singapore and China stood out in this regard. While these two uh, countries have um, remarkably different goals, different drivers of science and technology innovation, different population scales to say the least, different markets, they use similar strategies in shaping their cultures to focus on S&T priorities. Essentially, culture and S&T priorities were hand in hand. And they also experienced similar achievements. And we could go in some detail about how that was done if, if we had some time. However, the other four countries, that is uh, Japan, Brazil, uh, India, and Russia, have been actually held back strikingly in their S&T achievements because of cultural issues that have limited the priority they would afford their S&T goals. Uh, Japan is a good example, just very quickly. How is Japan held back? No women in the workforce. Uh, it's a, a, a country that uh, is uh, reluctant to uh, welcome uh, international people to work in its laboratory, uh, labs, no immigration, universities don't work with industry. You can go down through Japan and there are a number of cultural issues which has essentially inhibited its advancement. And of course, it's been in the doldrums for two decades, as we all know. So when the national security of the United States is threatened, such as after 9-11 or S Sputnik and so forth, our nation has abruptly changed its culture to, to support national security priority. However, these occasions are fortunately rare, and, but they're also widely recognized as uh, national, requiring national security priority. But if we do not recognize the significance of the declining course of U.S. competitiveness in science and technology and innovation, our future prosperity and national security, uh, basically, we will, not, we will not change our S&T priority need to fix this problem. I actually believe that's where we are today. We do not see, as a nation, this is a critical problem. I also believe it would be instructive for those in policymaking positions to visit China and Singapore uh, to gain a firsthand uh, understanding of why they are succeeding and what changes in cultures they have actually in instituted at some cost to themselves to achieve this success. I'm confident this would be a stunning experience for all who went there. I think only then will we fully understand the seriousness of our national competitiveness problem and the priority attention that we really need to apply to this to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moat. We will now begin our first round of questions, and I recognize myself for uh, uh, that first uh, five minutes. Um, to the three uh, former CEOs, uh, you each ran major corporations. Dr. Barrett pointed out that you had a, had a um, research budget bigger than NSF. Um, now that you are retired, have your Social Security and paying taxes like the rest of us, you know, why should we taxpayers subsidize uh, public research for uh, major corporations? Dr. Barrett. I frankly don't think the U.S. government and the taxpayers should subsidize research within the private corporations uh, unless the government has a specific project or objective, such if you want to create an exascale computer uh, 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 for government activity and, and uh, future research. Uh, the request is really to fund research in the, <coughs> the virtual National Laboratory of the United States, which is in fact the tier one research institutions, is to fund basic research, pre-competitive research, research which is probably at least eight to 10 years from any competitive introduction. That research is not funded by corporations to any great degree for a variety of reasons. It is carried out in universities in the public environment that, that uh, the public has great access to so the demand or the request is not to fund research within corporations. It's really to fund research within the U.S. research universities. Pre-competitive research, research that might create products, services, new companies, but far in advance, not the sort of research that an Intel, an IBM, uh, DuPont, Lockheed Martin would do, which is directed towards products of tomorrow or within a few years. Anyone else want to? Mr. Holliday? Uh, I, I would agree uh, uh, totally. Uh, I, I would just add a, a short vignette. Uh, I was at the DuPont annual patent dinner 
sitting next to an individual who was winning his 100th patent that night. And he was talking about how we had moved our research effort toward more applied, more applications, and less basic. And he was cautioning me about the problem of that. My answer was, we must depend on the universities to provide that basic research for us and our competitors. And he said, but what if those universities aren't there to do it? And so that's really what we're talking about today is that basic research uh, uh, that must be at the university level, it's better done at the university level or the national labs, so all competitors can have access to it and compete to make it a success. Dr. Augustine? Yes, I, I would be opposed to uh, the government subsidizing uh, work or activities in a company that can lead to a predictable uh, impact on an individual company's uh, uh, profitability. Uh, I would also note that uh, a few decades ago, two-thirds of the R&D in this co country were funded by the government and only one-third by industry. Today, industry funds two-thirds and the government one-third. The problem is that industry largely funds the D, and uh, the problem that we're, of course, discussing in the hearing is, is R, research, uh, basic research. Uh, basic research has a couple of problems that make it not very uh, amenable for uh, work by uh, industry. Uh, one of these is that the benefits of basic research often don't accrue to the performer or the underwriter of the research being performed because of the unpredictability of the, the applicability of research. And that sort of is the basic category of uh, things where the government generally steps in and, and provides that service, uh, running educational systems, uh, providing national security, and so on. A second feature of basic research is it's very long-term, very high risk, and in many cases, very expensive. And those factors just don't lend themselves to the sort of things that the marketplace today will, will allow companies to invest in. With the great short-term emphasis of the markets, uh, companies, by and large, are going to have to invest in shorter-term things like development. So it would seem to me that research is the province of government, development is the pro province of industry. And finally, Mr. Holliday, in your um, uh, presentation, you mentioned this business plan for the American's energy future. You know, we've got health care problems, transportation problems, you know, feeding our, our public. There, there are lots of different areas. Why did you pick out energy? We saw energy at a low cost could transform across the entire co economy to make a difference. That, that was the one thing that we, we thought was about our national security, so we control it ourselves, and really have a cost advantage to reinvigorate our manufacturing and overall productive capability of the country. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hall is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Holliday, I sure agree with you uh, on the energy situation. Uh, for youngsters graduating from high school or college or, or beginning their life in the business world, probably the most important word in the dictionary other than prayer for that set of young people is probably energy because energy is the cause of most wars or lack of energy is the cause of most wars. And uh, Japan didn't hate us. They didn't bomb Pearl Harbor because they hated us. They bombed us because we cut them off of their, absolutely all of their oil. They, we were their sole supplier. And they had about uh, maybe a year's national existence. So you could expect that to happen. But uh, I thank you for, for suggesting that because it reminded me again of yesterday. Uh, Dr. Barrett, uh, you alluded to keeping our jobs here and, and the good record that your company has of, of keeping uh, the successes you have here onshore rather than sending them offshore. And I, I think all of us appreciate that. In your testimony, uh, and along that line, I, I think of a parallel there that we all go through up here because all of us appoint youngsters to the academies, to West Point, uh, Navy, Air Force, and all that. And usually my board asks them if they're going to make it a lifetime work, you know. Uh, they have the right, to, I think, at, le at the end of four years or maybe five years to come back into the business world. And I don't think that's altogether bad because they bring the disciplines they learn there into the business world where discipline's really needed. But it's similar to that. Uh, in your testimony, you discussed the importance of investing in research and development to promote new technologies, and you say once the in, uh, investments have been made in the new technologies and they're ready for the marketplace, 
What incentives are in place to ensure that the companies that reap the benefits of federal tax dollars for research and development will stay in the United States? And why did you do it? Well, I, point of uh, the fact, I said that 75% of our manufacturing yes. is still in the U.S. and yes. That means 25% of it is outside. Uh, one of the reasons for that t to date if I could just digress for a moment, the net present value of one of our multi-billion dollar manufacturing facilities, there's a billion dollar difference in its NPV if you put it in the United States or if you put it in a low tax country. Mm -hmm. And the billion dollar NPV difference is really not related to wage rates, it's related to government incentives and tax rates. The reason we have maintained our manufacturing facilities in the U.S. is we have a well-trained workforce in the United States. Time is of the essence. If you have to retrain a workforce to do a greenfield manufacturing plant someplace else, you can lose valuable time. There is no financial incentive to put those plants in the United States today. Mm -hmm. The financial disincentive is the U.S. tax rate. So what you're seeing is perhaps a lasting uh, uh, legacy of the fact that we started in the U.S., we built up our major facilities in the U.S., we have a well-trained workforce in the U.S., we have continuity in the U.S., but if you start from scratch today, there is no incentive to put those plants in the United States. Maybe you're before the wrong committee, maybe you ought to go before Ways and Means. Uh, uh, Congressman Hall, I've been through every <laughs> committee. <laughs> <laughs> every administration, Democrat and Republican, every economic advisor to every president with the well, same story, and we're still where we are. I admire you for it, and I thank you. I, I, I want to ask this additional question, though. Similarly, how do we ensure that students who are being trained in the U.S. don't take their knowledge overseas? How can we keep those people here? Well, and those that come here to seek to be citizens to get their education and lead in, in uh, degrees, all the universities all across the country, and then take their knowledge home. Well, over a decade ago, I think we were the first to suggest that you just simply staple a green card to every advanced degree, engineering, technology, mathematics, science degree obtainer, regardless of nationality. If they graduate from U.S. University with an advanced degree, staple a green card to that diploma and let them stay. Uh, there is no way to absolutely ensure that that knowledge base stays here. Uh, the way you ensure it is to, in fact, make the United States the destination of choice for startups, the destination of choice for people who want to get a great education. But you have to have the visa issue, the immigration issue, and then the tax and incentive issues here to create startups and, and grow them. No, thank you, sir. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Johnson's recognized, I think, over the last, uh, or, um, excuse me, I, I, was, I was wrong, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Edwards was here uh, first. Each of you win the, the uh, attendance award uh, for, this, uh, for this session, and I thank you for that. But Ms. Edwards, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a question. First of all, I want to say um, on the, you know, the one point r regarding research and development, um, I actually introduced last week um, H.R. 6201, the 21st Century Investment Act of 2010, and part of the reason that I did that was really because of my experience in visiting small manufacturing facilities out in my congressional district where they co-located um, the research and development that we're doing with the manufacturing they were doing. And it was really important to have that manufacturing line really close to where the R&D was happening. And what we do in 6201, and I know that's not before this committee, though, is to actually incentivize both um, and make permanent the research and development tax credit. It's one of the lowest among developing nations in this country. Increase and make that permanent. And also um, uh, create a substantial um, uh, res uh, tax credit that's an incentive for co-locating manufacturing. When I talk to our manufacturers, what they say to me is that 
Um, it's really important for them, both in terms of building and training their, their workforce, but also then drawing on the local uh, community, our local educational institutions, our local K-12, and, and establishing those relationships because they then know that that's the feeder ground uh, for their manufacturing and for their research and development. And so I'd urge you, all, Mr. Hall, take a look at, at, at that, but all of you, because I think that if we're talking about where we're going to go for the 21st century, we have to think not in pockets, but across the line from how we're creating the pipeline, obviously, in, in K-12 and in our higher education institutions. But then, you know, what's the em employee base and what do what do job creators need? I mean, they're going to do, if we invest in their innovation, what do they need? And I, right now, I think there's not this sort of seamless uh, line from our K-12 education and through our higher ed system into the, into the workplace. And so I appreciate your, um, your comments, uh, uh, Mr. Augustine, on this question of trying to create a seamless line from K to 12 through uh, the, the point when that um, young person goes into the workforce. And what is it that we can do um, to, um, to knit those together so that they're not in these, um, these uh, individual streams? And then if uh, Dr. Mote, I know that at the University of Maryland, and thank you for your service there, that uh, your experience in working with our local scientific institutions um, in Maryland with our education institutions uh, so that they feed into the workplace. And uh, if you can do it in two, two minutes and 13 seconds, that'd be great. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the business community has a, an obligation, uh, which it, I think, doesn't fully carry out today to make very clear what are the skills it needs from a high school graduate. Uh, you pointed to that. Uh, one of the, if one looks at college graduates, uh, there's a significant problem of the, of the gap between what skills and abilities and knowledge it's required to get a high school diploma and what it takes to succeed as a freshman in college. And somehow we've got to close that gap. Uh, I would give that very high priority. Um, Congressman Edwards, uh, uh, two things. Uh, one is in terms of the uh, K through 12 uh, students, uh, bringing them to the university for special programs, educational programs, research and laboratories. That's part of the mission of the university. And secondly, uh, on the uh, output end, um, we uh, essentially guarantee internships for every student at the university. We have an office which basically creates internships. And in this area, since there are so many internships uh, in the area, it's uh, uh, fairly easy to accomplish this. And so, therefore, we want to engage the students uh, in the, uh, the business communities and at various levels, but also could be national laboratories where these internships take place. So I think uh, thinking of the university as a link to both the K-12 system and the job, uh, jobs and postgraduate opportunities as well is essentially the way we see ourselves. We, we see ourselves really as the most important asset that the state has in developing its future. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Thank you. Then Dr. <laughs> Ehlers is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for the panel for being here. I, uh, I can't, you know, now that I'm leaving here, I just, I just want to commend you for, uh, you have no idea how often I was trying to sell an idea in the Congress and not getting very far, and then one or more of you would make a comment public that was supported what I was trying to do. And I could say, well, you know, so-and-so said this. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's, uh, the Christ was right when he said a prophet is not without honor in his, in his same assembly. And uh, I found that over and over. Uh, I really appreciate what you have done for our country. And uh, now that I'm joining the ranks of the retired and unemployed, I hope I can con contribute as much as you have. Uh, I want to just get back to the question that was uh, mentioned about what uh, the federal government should pay for research in private corporations. I think the simple, straightforward answer is a very good, healthy research and development tax credit. So the companies are still deciding what to study, what to do the research on. It's entirely their project, but at least let the federal government give them tax relief because Many of these are high-risk ventures, and corporations simply can't afford to do them if they don't get some assistance, preferably a tax credit. 
Uh, I uh, appreciate Mr. Holliday's comment about low-cost clean energy. You're, you're right on. That's totally correct. And that's something we all have to be working on and not just say, well, let the utilities take care of that. Uh, it's a much broader problem than that. The, uh, and and uh, Dr. Moat, uh, you comment about other nations are trying to catch up. We assume we're already there. And that's a, f a fallacious belief in this country. The, uh, the public, and I've given speeches all across the land, the public simply doesn't believe that there is a problem. They simply believe that we are on top, we're ahead of the pack, we have nothing to worry about, and the only reason other countries are making progress is because they have lower wage rates. They're totally wrong on that, and we have to educate them. But I, I can assure you from my many contacts with the public that this is the general attitude. I, uh, I would be delighted to see some of you running for Congress and uh, taking my place. It's incredibly hard to persuade scientists and engineers uh, to run for public office. And I have given, once again, given speeches to engineering and science groups across this country, constantly urging them to run for office. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Uh, fortunately, uh, since I arrived, the number of physicists have tripled, but we could certainly f use a, a few more engineers and chemists as well uh, to, to uh, help in this task. And I, I really uh, feel very guilty about retiring and leaving uh, because uh, it's not that I'm so wonderful, it's just that the knowledge I have is badly needed here. And I hope the other two physicists uh, grab hold of it and can take care of it. But really, we need much better representation here from the scientific and technical community if we are really going to accurately reflect and s try to solve the nation's problems in this area, whether it's education, uh, whether it's patent, patent law, so many different aspects of it. And uh, it's a major part of our country's future but it's not a major part of the agenda of either, either the House or the Senate. Uh, pardon me for giving you a sermon. I know you already believe all these things, uh, but as I said before, I'm the son of a preacher and I can't get out without giving a sermon. But I really think that's, that's the crux of it. Uh, and Dr. Moat's problem of the people assume everything is okay, that's because they're not hearing anything else from the Congress, from the administration, and uh, we really have to have the support of the people if we're going to do it. So thank you so very much for what you're doing. You've been great leaders of this nation on these issues, and I hope you will continue to do that, and I hope I can assist you once I'm uh, a private citizen again. So thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, may I have just a minute? I want to thank Dr. Ehlers, too, for his long service here. And I hope he never forgets what I told him the first week we were on the same committee together, that I admired him, but I didn't like him. <laughs> because he's just a type like you four that ruined the curve for guys like me. <laughs> but he's been a great benefit to this committee. He's been a benefit to me personally, and we're losing a great friend and, and a great member of this com conference. And we're going to call on you like we are Bart. Uh, when he's an ambassador over in France or England, wherever he is. I, <laughs> I want his telephone number, and I want yours. I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, Dr. Ehlers has been the conscience of the scientific community for us, and we thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And gentlemen, I would like to echo the sentiments of Dr. Ehlers and others in saying that it's uh, wonderful, the work that you're doing and, and putting yourselves uh, in a position to use the experience that you've acquired throughout your life and your education and your business experience to help make our lives better and certainly for our next generation. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I have a few questions I would like to ask in, in no way provocative, but just to try to get to the point of how we can maybe save some jobs for America and how we can do some of the things here. My first is for Mr. Augustine, in your written testimony, you mentioned that an American company, Applied Materials, recently opened the world's largest private solar research development company in China. And Mr. Barrett, also, my understanding that Intel has opened research um, 
labs on semiconductors and, serve, and server networks in Beijing, China. Uh, there are just two of the many instances of our U.S. jobs going over to overseas. What policies are necessary from the government standpoint that we can use to incentivize companies to keep their jobs on American soil and employ American workers? Uh, Congressman Wilson, if I might answer that with a, with a little uh, a story. Uh, I've in a moment of boredom figured out that I've attended over 500 Fortune 100 board meetings. And at many of those, we were faced with a kind of decision that uh, you asked, uh, sh should we build a plant in the United States or should we build it overseas? If you build it in the United States, uh, your average worker will be a, come from the bottom quartile of the world's uh, high school graduates. Uh, you'll be in a country with the second highest tax rate, uh, corporate tax rate, uh, in the world. You'll be in a country with a stagnating economy, or at best a stable economy. Uh, if you, uh, you will be in a country where you pay a, uh, a, an assembly worker between uh, four and 20 times uh, what you would pay in many other countries. You'll pay uh, uh, a chemist uh, eight times as much and an engineer five times as much as in some highly qualified countries. If you go to these other countries, uh, you get a, uh, typically a five-year tax holiday for, for your new, new facility you set up. Uh, your average high school graduate employee will come from the top tenth of the class. Uh, engineers will be abundant. Uh, the, uh, uh, you will generally be given free land to build your plant. And if you're the strongest American in the world, acting as a fiduciary responsibility for your shareholders, you uh, will build a plant overseas. And that's what I've seen over and over. And those are the things we need to fix. Thank you. Uh, Norm mentioned a, a number of features, which uh, some of them are related to manufacturing, some of them to R&D. I'll, I'll just focus on the R&D side. Uh, the company I used to work for, Intel, it's an international company, does about 80% of its business outside of the United States. That is 80% of its revenue comes from foreign customers. To be internationally competitive, the company has to hire the best and brightest engineers for its R&D laboratories wherever they reside. Uh, if you look at where they reside today, some of them reside in the U.S., but some of them reside in Russia, some in China, some in Malaysia, uh, some in India. We follow the best and brightest. Uh, not all of the best and brightest are U.S. citizens. And therefore, to be competitive, we look around the world. As I said, 85% or so of our R&D activities are U.S. domestic located. The things you can do would be to, in fact, follow the programs to get more U.S. kids interested in R&D or science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, follow that through to get more of our young people majoring in those topics at the university level. Have an immigration policy which allows foreign nationals who come to our universities comprise the bulk of our STEM graduates uh, to stay in the United States. Have a permanent R&D tax credit. Lower the corporate tax rate. There are a whole litany of these items, but these are the things the government can do. You can't expect, I think, the multinationals to hire all U.S. citizens because we do the great majority of our business outside of the U.S. We're relatively proud that we still have the great majority of our work going on in the U.S. to service our international customers. But we can't be digital 100 percent U.S. 0 percent foreign nationals. Mr. Chairman, I realize I'm out of time, but if I could just thank him. Uh, thank you both, because really you focused the issue and framed it, and, that, and that's what, I, what I've been looking for in this hearing this morning. And uh, so thank you. I have other questions, Mr. Chairman, but I realize my time is up. <clears throat> thank Mr. you, Wilson. gentlemen. Mr. Mr. McCall is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for being here today. I, uh, as the Chairman knows, I've been a, a strong advocate and supporter of the Competes Act. Um, my uh, district has a research and development arm of the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, the high tech, all the companies you mentioned are in some form or fashion in my district. Uh, and it's a federal investment that um, while I'm against a lot, a lot of the current spending uh, in the Congress, I think this is one of those investments that we can't afford not to do. 
and, and the return on the investment, like with the NASA program, it has been extraordinary. Um, we talked about the gathering storm. I agree, Dr. Moat, that this is a national security issue uh, as well. Uh, but I see a gathering storm occurring right now in the Congress as the Competes Act uh, stagnates in the Senate, uh, the possibility that it may not pass, uh, in combination with a, the tax cuts uh, expiring. Um, and then we have an extraordinary large tax increase. And I, I know the R&D tax credit is, is huge. I know the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, penalizing companies that, that do business overseas. And I think we need to incentivize through the tax code uh, businesses to locate here and create jobs here in the United States. And I think that's something we can do. But the storm I see, though, is, is a combination of these two events, competes not passing, and then the tax uh, cuts expiring. Um, and I just, that's real, the reality right now that we're looking at in the Congress. And, I just wanted to get the panel to, to comment on those two events colliding uh, at the same time. Uh, f first, I, I, I agree that these, these are very important issues. One thing I would like you to possibly consider is in the way you give credits for companies to locate here, think about it project by project, not as across the board issues. In Dan's summary of the six countries that were doing a good job, China and Singapore came to the top. And let me assure you, they will sit down with any major company in the U.S. and talk about a project you want to put there and what do you need to accomplish it. Norm described some of those kind of concessions about land and training and so forth. We, we have that on the state level here. We don't have it on the national level. And I'd urge you to think about some kind of a very, very objective where it could not be politically motivated, it would be right interest of the country to allow companies to come forward and make that case. That's a, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, briefly, I, I use the example of the net present value of one of our manufacturing facilities. It's like a Texas instrument. When Texas Instruments did a lot of manufacturing in the U.S., but it's a multi-billion dollar facility, employs a couple of thousand people at extraordinarily high manufacturing salaries. Uh, the disincentive in the United States to locate those facilities is the corporate tax rate and the lack of any incentives at the national level. State by state can give some incentives, but those are second tier incentives relative to the federal tax rate. <coughs> the biggest disincentive is to locating those facilities ongoing is in fact the essentially the highest corporate tax rate in the world. In fact, drives people to make the logical financial investment to locate those facilities outside of the U.S. into a low or zero tax rate environment. If I could just, because, you know, the companies I talk to, my, they want to stay here in the United States, uh, but we're not providing the incentives. And uh, bottom line, it's about making a profit. You have a duty to your shareholders. And if we can't incentivize them to stay here, they're not going to, although they, they want to. They're patriotic. But uh, Dr. Augustine? I just wanted to add to your, your comments that I can't think of a stronger signal that this Congress could send uh, in a negative fashion than to not pass the America Competes Act. Uh, the members of the science and engineering community, uh, the business community, uh, I suspect might conclude that uh, it's over. Uh, I realize those are strong words, but uh, they're considered words. Uh, I, I, I think of the, just as an example, uh, to set a framework, as Congressman Wilson said, uh, America has always been the leading country in particle physics. Uh, they've, this country has always had the, the most powerful accelerator in the world. Uh, with now, for the first time, the most powerful accelerator is in France and Switzerland. The physicists from around the world are moving to France and Switzerland. They're leaving America, going there because that's where the work is, that's where the excitement is, uh, that's where the promise is, and that's the challenge I think we face. Right, and that's compelling testimony, Mr. Chairman, uh, to say it, if, if it doesn't pass, it, it's over. And I think that uh, I, I would love to see nothing more than, than this passing out of the Senate and being really the legacy of the chairman who has tried to advance this and advance the ball. And uh, I hope that this will have some impact on deliberations in the Senate so we can move forward. Uh, in this Congress, and thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Bacall. You know, I think a common denominator here is that Intel, Lockheed, whoever it might be, um, DuPont, if they're looking to relocate, it's not between Tennessee and Texas, it's between the United States and somewhere else, and that we have to recognize uh, that. Um, Ms. Johnson, um, the patient Ms. Johnson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for being a little late. I was in the Senate testifying. There are people in the Senate who are trying to move this legislation. I don't know how successful they'll be. Let me um, <clears throat> say one of my questions was just answered. I was going to ask uh, Mr. Augustine about how the uh, businesses would see it if we did not pass the bill, and you answered very appropriately. I'm really at a loss. I want to thank Dr. Ellis for uh, being on this committee and offering his leadership. Uh, for 18 years, I've been talking about the same thing, and I don't know whether we are gaining any ground or not. And listening to and reading your testimony, um, it seems to me that we are going backwards. I really wish I knew what else I could do. Um, I was sitting here thinking that maybe we need to have a summit with many of our business leaders and many of our leaders here in Congress so they could come to understand what we are facing. Um, I, I'm, I'm really pretty frustrated with where we are and getting our K through 12 education in order. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about it. I haven't seen much of an in, uh, improvement. A as well as our basic college, we have a lot of scholarships offered. Um, and we're trying to do all the things that could lend itself to making these strides, but it does not seem that we are making them. Um, just, just give me, if all of you could just give me an idea of how you think we could go about educating our leadership here and the right committees so that we can move a little faster. I think the members of this committee understand that, but I'm not sure whether we have that understanding across the board where we need it in our leadership here. If I might just touch on the issue of education for one minute. Uh, um, I think all of us have been leading advocates for improving K through 12 education in the United States and all the statistics, as you correctly point out, 17 year olds understanding of math and science has not budged in three or four decades. So it's absolutely flat while the rest of the world has come up and we've gone from number one to in the bottom mm -hmm. quartile of the OECD countries. As much as a pessimist as I am, I actually mm -hmm. do see a couple of optimistic things happening. Uh, one is we now have 37 states signed up for common core curriculum, K through 12, subject matter by subject matter. Now, signing up for something and doing something, as you well know, are two different things. But getting 37 states to sign up for a common core curriculum is the first step. Uh, there's also a consortium of states that are providing a state-driven, internationally benchmarked common assessment tool. That is, do away with the 50 different state assessments and have a common internationally benchmarked assessment tool for K-12 mm -hmm. education. I frankly think those two things, plus the private sector getting involved and change the equation in some other areas, give a sense of hope. Uh, the Race to the Top uh, program of Secretary Duncan has caused over 30 states to change their legislative uh, rules and regulations about charter schools, pay for performance. All of these things are building blocks. They have not changed the bottom line yet. The results, the kids that get out of school this year are probably gonna have the same results as the kids that got out of school last year, but at least we are finally attacking the basic fundamental building blocks. If I could share one example, I served for five years on China's development board where a group of business leaders and academics came to three days to Beijing to share with the highest levels of government what we thought China should do differently. If you could make the mirror image of that in the U.S., and invite business leaders and academic leaders from these growing countries in the world to come here and share their experiences of what the U.S. could do differently, it might change things. Thank you. 
my footnote would be that uh, if you could have more hearings uh, in committees other than this one where there's a strong understanding, I think, of the issues, where you had business people come in and explain why, why they put their plants in other countries and what it means to jobs and the standard of living and national security in this country. Uh, I suspect that the three companies that we worked for probably employ around a half million people, somewhere close to that. And I think we just need to get more people to come in and speak uh, with, with members to make clear what the consequences are. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have well, I, I would just like to comment on this. I think the uh, first-hand experience is really necessary to really understand the depth of our problem. And, and I would say if the leadership could actually get first-hand experience in, in China, for example, and really understand how it works and, and what the competitive level actually is, it would be stunning for them. And it would change their whole perspective on all the issues that would come subsequently. I don't think this can be learned out of books and, and out of hearings. It, it's, a, it's a sort of cultural issue. And uh, Singapore, as China's basically taken Singapore's playbook. Basically, China's designed this plan for infrastructure development and for market c competitiveness following Singapore's model. And it is really s frightening t to see. It's so effective. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Charles, what can I ask? I really think at this point here, we ought to point out our problems of the past and our mistakes of the past. I may be the only one here that remembers the super collider. Uh, Eddie Bernice probably remembers it. Uh, I remember when we got to the crossroads there, I think they either needed, and I'm not very good on math, but I think they either needed 600 million or 6 million, and we offered them either 2 million or 200 million. I can't remember which it was. It doesn't make much difference now because that's no money today, and I hope nobody ever tells this president how much a jillion is. But uh, we, we turned them down, and, and, and we lost that. We wound up with a giant hole from Waxahachie, Texas, halfway to Dallas, and we lost our chance to go ahead in the world of science. And, and uh, so we have a history of, of not being practical and not salvaging a great... I went to CERN uh, with others here. Maybe some here were with us there. I even talked a lot of those people into coming to the United States to work and to help us get the super collider kicked off. And it's hard to say goodbye to them when they left to go back there to their old jobs. But that's something we can look back on, a grave mistake that was made. And it's made because we didn't, we didn't have sense enough to do what you men are suggesting to us to do at that time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hall. We try to follow regular order here, which means that a lot of the work uh, in this committee falls upon the subcommittees, and the subcommittee chairman and ranking members have to put really an exceptional amount of time into that, and uh, Mr. Inglis has uh, been one of those um, excellent ranking members um, on one of the most active subcommittees that we have, and uh, I thank you for that contribution and also recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, and I want to uh, join you and uh, Ranking Member Hall in uh, thanking the panel for focusing on energy as an opportunity for us. And so um, let me ask you whether the, the challenge there is that we haven't yet unleashed the power of free enterprise to fix the problem. Um, I, I agree that uh, some of the things we can do in this committee are important, very important to provide some research and that sort of thing. Um, if we could combine that effort with a way to make money out of inventing and commercializing the new fuels, then we'd have something going. But our challenge is that the incumbent fuels, particularly transportation fuels being petroleum and coal in the case of electricity, the negative externalities are not recognized the government is failing in its function to force a recognition of those negative externalities, and as long as they get freebies, then how do you compete? If you've got this better technology, how do you compete? Cap and trade has just died. It's, uh, we can give it a death certificate now. Um, uh, so how about an alternative, which is a revenue neutral carbon tax? Uh, basically reduce uh, payroll taxes, 
and then an equal amount shift the tax to carbon dioxide. Start out at $15 a ton, end up at $100 a ton over a 30 year period. Make it a border adjustable tax, uh, WTO compliant so that you remove it on export, you impose it on import. And then watch the free enterprise system say, oh, you wanted a, an alternative to petroleum. We got it. And we can make it and deliver it to the customer at a price point that can beat petroleum. But until we do that, take that action, it seems to me we're never going to get, we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to do these research things, which are fabulous. But until you get the lift of the free enterprise system saying, by golly, I can make a buck doing that, I can deliver to a desiring customer a useful product. When you get that, things start happening. Um, so uh, that's my little commercial for um, a 15-page alternative to the 1,200-page monstrosity of cap and trade. Um, and it's something that I think that uh, conservatives thinking straight and liberals thinking straight should come together and say, that works. Um, because you know this idea I've just described? Al Gore and Art Laffer agree on it. And if Al Gore and Art Laffer can agree, can't we get the country to agree? What do you think? Can we get, uh, can we get folks to say, yes, free enterprise is going to deliver. The companies that you all have so effectively led can deliver the solutions here, right? I mean, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. I, I agree totally if we could have certainty around the energy environment. And you prescribe one way, there are other ways. It would unleash creativity in this country we cannot imagine. And I think we are better positioned than even China and Singapore to take advantage of that because we can respond quicker to a market force than they ever can. One simple example that's playing out today. We didn't talk about unconventional natural gas three or four years ago. Nobody knew, understood what it meant. When natural gas spiked and, we, and people had confidence the price was going to be higher, we started raising all new questions we hadn't before, and now there's an opportunity in energy that's going to be very amazing. Not the answer, but amazing. So I agree with you totally. We've got to let the market system work, and you can play a role in that. Yeah. Anybody else take a shot at that? The, 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 inter, uh, unleashing the power of the free enterprise system to solve it. Well, I suspect all, all, all four of us are great believers in the free enterprise system, but uh, uh, the, the market, of course, is reacting to the uh, incentives that it sees today. And uh, the study that uh, Chad chaired that I had the privilege of serving on uh, pointed out that uh, the pharmaceutical companies, I believe, spend around like 15 percent of their revenues on R&D. Uh, aerospace industry, it's around 10, 11 percent. Uh, the uh, energy companies, the traditional companies, it's three-tenths of a percent. And that's the correct thing to do for their shareholders and the model that we've built today. And so we need a new model. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Inglis. And I th <clears throat> think we can probably expect a different view on something from Mr. Robacher, who's recognized for five minutes. <laughs> Not Comrade Robacher again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I do have some different thoughts on this. I. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps the fundamental problem that we have is that we don't have anyone watching out for the American people. I hear a lot of suggestions, and in fact, a lot of them are detached from what's good for the American people as a people. And what, uh, you know, I don't think that we should have as many foreigners coming here, getting those graduate student position slots, and then asking them to stay here. I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to have American students, even if they're just the B-plus students instead of the A-plus students from India and China, it's better to have them in those, in those positions. Uh, this whole idea of, uh, well, you can follow that right on through. We have acquiesced, the United States has acquiesced to a policy of a one-way free trade policy with China for 30 years. And now let me ask the panel, when a solar panel a company sets up manufacturing in China, is that not because they cannot sell their panels in China unless they're manufactured there? So we let them get away with policies like that rather than having, say, look, you have access to our market. 
uh, we've got to have access to yours. We're not watching out for the American people. Our people are going to lose. We have permitted the wholesale theft of our intellectual property for the last 30 years, not only to China, but elsewhere. And I don't hear anything about that. The pharmaceutical companies that we just heard mentioned, they spend billions of dollars of research money. And what happens? The Chinese steal it. They go over there, and they're selling knockoffs. So what do they do? They have to pass on that price to the American people. We end up having the American people paying more for their medicine in order to subsidize the Chinese people whose medicine is being paid for by us. Uh, the, the chairman, uh, uh, or the ranking member, mentioned the super collider. All right, we didn't pay for it. Has China put any money into the super collider? Has they? The panel? They put money into super collider research? No, because they want us to put our money in so they can take the benefits, so they can get the benefit of the research. Who's watching out for the American people? I mean, I'm sorry, I hear, uh, uh, you know, what I'm hearing today is not something that gets to the point of, of how this average Joe out there who's unemployed is going to find himself in a job, or at least a, a, a well-paying job. Uh, what I'm hearing is, is, is you know, for example, to, we, we heard education, education, education. I've, been, I've sat through probably five of these hearings, and each time we bring up the idea that one of the major problems in education is that we have unions that are basically protecting uh, 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 mediocre teachers, and we got unions that are protecting people who teach courses that are not essential, and they have to be paid the same amount of money as someone who teaches engineering and science. Well, of course, we're not going to get any high-quality engineers and science teachers if they have to get paid the same people who teach, as, teach basket weaving. Well, the bottom line is, unless we're willing to address these things and watch out for the American people, the American people are going to suffer, and I think that's what's happening right now, especially in terms of China. Uh, by the way, these graduate students that we want to keep here, why do we want to have uh, Chinese students swarming into these graduate positions, teaching them information that cost us billions of dollars of research to do, so they can go back to China, so they can go back to China, and they can then utilize that information to outcompete us. They realize they're our adversary. We don't realize they're, they're our adversary, and we're treating them as if it's okay to give them the edge on the American people. And uh, I'm sorry if I sound a little bit wild here today, because I always do. But the <laughs> fact is, I feel, <laughs> I feel, but I feel strongly, I feel totally strongly about this, unless we start protecting the intellectual property rights of our people, of our companies, again, from China and elsewhere. They get the biggest ch uh, cyber uh, spy network in the world at play in China right now, trying to glean anything they can from us. Until we start protecting our intellectual property rights from outright theft and spying and having a, a, uh, uh, an equal trade relationship, our people are going to continue to suffer, and I think that's the basis of the problem, Mr. Chairman. So with that said, uh, please, you've got uh, four seconds to comment on my comment. Uh, the best thing you can do for the watching out for the American people is give the next generation of the American workforce the best education in the world. That's the only way they're going to compete. There's not a person on this panel who's not a parent and a grandparent who has grandkids who want to have the same opportunity that we did, and that means we want the United States to succeed. Uh, let me just offer a slight rebuttal to your comment about who wants Chinese students here, A-plus students. We've got plenty of B-plus students. Uh, it's an A-plus world. If you want to compete internationally, you need A-plus students. We hire the best students we can. I wish they were American students. The matter of fact is we have failed at getting our younger generation proficient and interested in the subject matter which is going to be the basis for the 21st century economy. We have to do a better job at that. And the private sector is stepping up. I was just at the NBC Education Summit in New York City yesterday and where this topic was addressed for two full days, government reps, private 
reps, uh, this is the challenge we have. And it is a uniquely American challenge. We have to educate our children to be successful in the international marketplace. You cannot have a Microsoft, a Cisco, an Intel, a DuPont with just B-plus players. You cannot. You need the best talent from around the world to have those companies successful in the international marketplace. Even if the trading rules are set up so that their uh, uh, trading rules uh, favor the, the Chinese. I am, and as I think everyone on this panel, would all, bo all be for fair and legal trade. Balanced trade, back and forth, protection of intellectual property. All of us would be proponents of those comments that you made. Uh, but the basic challenge that you have for the United States is in fact having a workforce which can be internationally competitive and then setting the playing field level in the United States with international companies. That leveling of the playing field is let's be legal with intellectual property and trade policies, but at the same time, let's also recognize what the government's responsibility is to set the playing field level for companies to operate here, to invest here. Why penalize U.S. companies to make investments in the United States. That's exactly what we're doing today. Time has expired. As you can see, we are a committee of, of a big tent. Um, <laughs> Ms. Biggert uh, is recognized, uh, will be our uh, last uh, 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 questioner in that we're going to be having votes here very shortly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Um, I'm sorry that I missed all of your testimony. You are all my heroes. I think what, what you are doing uh, to really bring us back where we are, we just have to have the education of our kids and we've got to just move forward so much in the science and, and research. And uh, Mr. Augustine and Mr. Holliday, uh, I, I know you both served on the, the gathering storm, uh, which I thought, and, and Dr. Burns, I'm sorry. Um, this was such an important thing, I think, for uh, for science in this country and, and for us moving forward in, in this committee. And uh, I also, uh, then the American Energy Innovation uh, Council, and I had the opportunity to go to the dinner before the, the press uh, announcement of that, and this was was really, I think, such an important you know step forward, too, as, as well as the revised gathering storm. But you just have to keep it up because we really have to move forward, and I think we have, you know, in... In, uh, in Congress, as far as our colleagues and knowing how much the uh, uh, research and development is, I just w I wanted to ask you that, you know, we've got we've got uh, just a l limited amount of money. We're certainly not uh, uh, doing so well right now. Where we, but the you know the competes act to me was really important that we move forward with that. Uh, but uh, the gathering storm report says that we should double the funding for uh, basic research, and then the uh, Energy Innovation Council I, report, I believe, says that we should spend an additional $11 billion on uh, uh, energy technology development, demonstration, and commercialization. So uh, I think now in, in the economic times that we're in, it's really hard to, um, to do everything that we want to do. And so if, if you were in Congress, um, and you had to prioritize which of which uh, how would you start with these areas and which would go first and and which would you give your first dollars to the uh, like early stage benefit be, uh, basic research or the late uh, stage development and commercialization activities mr. Augustine that's a terrific question that we've all thought about a lot of course and uh, I, I it, it's a little bit like asking do I want to give up water or food uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we just can't afford not to do these things, and I think we can afford to do them, and I say that, uh, uh, for example, if uh, America had spent more on legal tobacco uh, during this five years, uh, we could have done every all of the 20 recommendations, every one of them, the, the Gathering Storm study, uh, for what the Americans spent on legal tobacco uh, during that period of time and had $60 billion a year left over. Uh, so we can't afford it, and I realize that's a little different from the federal government's budget, but I think th these things that uh, 
Congressman Hall had a little bit of fun with my comment at another event that uh, I'm an aeronautical engineer, and during my career I've worked on many airplanes that were overweight, and I pointed out that we never solved that problem by taking off an engine, and what we're talking here about are the engines, and I, I think we just have to do these things. I, I, just to add, uh, uh, totally supportive of what Norm said, but as, as we met with the American en Energy Innovation Council, we basically asked ourselves the question, how would we fund this? And if it was inside our companies, we would go through and take the lowest priority things we are currently doing and shift those funds to this. We would not create more funds for it. We would make choices. All of our experiences is a time like this forces you to make choices, and you shouldn't miss that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was just on the floor speaking about you cut, and that's where we, you know, doing away with some of these programs that we um, uh, have been in existence for a long time. And as Ronald Reagan said, the closest thing to eternal life is a federal program. So we really do need to uh, to to uh, reprioritize our our, our uh, whatever we're doing. But um, and then just going back to uh, the STEM education things, how can how can we really ask, or, you know, that people really realize that, that they're being shortchanged on the education and we really have to improve that. We hear, you know, like with the Japanese that they're uh, studying all the time or the Chinese and, you know, their focus is on that education. I don't, I don't think that we want to have our students have to go to school seven days a week or things, but we have to find the way that we can really uh, ramp that up. Yeah. Anybody would like to address that? Well, I, I, the uh, priority of items there is uh, first and foremost to get uh, certified uh, math and science teachers in our public education system K through 12 and there are a number of programs which have been started in that direction and I'd uh, hardly uh, endorse them and, and push them forward. The private sector has recently gotten involved. We were discussing before you were here uh, something called change the equation with 100 plus companies trying to get kids more excited about studying STEM topics. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than all wanting to be a lawyer or a doctor, uh, but uh, to focus on math and engineering as well. But first and foremost, if you don't have good teachers in our K through 12 system, you're certainly not going to get children enthused about studying math and science if they don't respect and they don't learn from the teachers in the classroom. And the, and the teacher's not going to do a good job. If he's afraid the kids know more than they do. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to say, but the gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we follow regular order here, which puts a lot of work on our subcommittees, uh, and those chairmen uh, of the subcommittees put in a great deal of time, uh, Dr. Baird, uh, working with uh, Mr. Inglis, says they've been good partners in bringing us good legislation, and I recognize you here for, the, for now the final word. Well, I thank the chairman, and, and uh, mostly wanted to just thank you all. Uh, I. Uh, believe that the work you did and that the chairman did and this committee did may be central to to the future of this country without any exaggeration at all. And this is a, an institution that feeds on hyperbole, but I don't think it is hyperbole here. I actually think ARPA-E and, and the various things you've recommended that we've enacted, uh, thanks to this chairman and this committee, are profound game changers. And somewhere in this country, there are some scientists who are going to be successful at finding those solutions to our energy problems uh, that wouldn't be there without you. And, and we put, um, you know, when, when in doubt, throw a commission at a problem around here. But this is a commission that really did something. And I just want to thank you for your years of service to our country and for your service on this commission. And it, since I have the privilege of the last word, uh, I would like to ask my colleagues to join me in thanking this fantastic chairman we have of this committee who not only wrote that bill, but has stewarded this committee in a, a fair, bipartisan, wise, and, and constructive manner and made a profound difference not only on the committee, but on the House of Representatives in his state and this country. And it's been a privilege to serve. And uh, I'd like people to join me in thanking Chairman Bart Gordon for his service. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. I wish I could yield more time to you, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, time is coming to a close. Before we bring the hearing to a close, though, I want to sincerely thank our witnesses, not just for being here today, but for your continuing commitment to these issues that we're all uh, very committed to also. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions uh, the committee may ask uh, of the witnesses. Now I'd like to turn the gavel over to uh, uh, Mr. Hall.
That's a bit premature, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> now I'd like to yield myself one hour. <laughs> I join in thanking you, and I thank this fine chairman here. Uh, I hope I'm the chairman uh, almost a year from now, but I couldn't ask for a better chairman than you've been, Republican, Democrat, or third party. He's been totally, completely fair. And I never knew a person from Tennessee that I didn't admire because, but for Tennessee, it wouldn't be a, a Texas. And Bart always says, well, there wouldn't have been a Texas anyway if there's a back door in Alamo. So, uh, <laughs> but, but these men and women that are leaving us, uh, I appreciate them. Dr. Baird, we, we'll really miss you and your knowledge and background and, and genuine interest in what, what Jeremy Bentham called the greatest good for the greatest number. We appreciate all of you. With that, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.